I'd like to call this meeting of the uh, Jobs and Economic Growth Finance and Policy Committee to order. Today is Monday, March 14th. Members, we have three bills on the agenda for this afternoon. Our first one is Senate File 3771. Senator Rood, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't think I've been before this committee this year. Where's your treats? Amazing. <laughs> Where's my treats? <laughs> I'm treat enough here. <laughs> oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Today I have Senate File 3771, um, and I'm really excited to um, present this. You know, um, in my district, we have um, we live on hospitality and the resorts and everything, and we have a lot of uh, kids coming out of school that really need some training, and they might not want to have. Um, the college degree or even a, a short training. So this is great because this gives them skills so that when they go into the job, um, um, when they have their um, uh, interview, they at least have some skills that they can talk about. And it's a certification program so they can have a leg up again, you know, with the, the next person that maybe doesn't have that. So this is an, uh, a free online hospitality training program. And it's really modeled after the South Dakota. They've been very successful there. Uh, so we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We think we can do it here very easily in Minnesota. So that, with that, Mr. Chair, um, I have Mr. Wagson with me to discuss the bill. Uh, Senator Rood, I, it looks like we have an oh. A1 amendment for your bill. So yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. Yes, we do. This puts it in the in it's an author's amendment to put it in the um, in the shape it needs to be before this committee. Senator Champion, would you author the uh, A1 amendment? All right. Uh, Senator Champion moves the A1 amendment. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, welcome to the committee, Mr. Wilson. Please, please. Oh, I accidentally hit the wrong button. Uh, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and feel free to begin when you're ready. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Ben Wogsland. I'm the Executive Vice President for Hospitality Minnesota. We represent Minnesota's restaurant and food service, lodging and resort and campground industries. Uh, the bill before you here today uh, is a really important bill for, for our industry and our association. Uh, we've been working on this piece of legislation for about nine months now, as, uh, as Senator Rood indicated, uh, looking at South Dakota's highly successful online training program. Uh, their program includes 10 different modules to train young people in hospitality and in tourism across the state. Uh, and, you know, when, as we've talked with their version of, uh, of Explore Minnesota Tourism, that being Visit South Dakota, uh, they have very, very positive things to say about uh, this program and its ability to train youth and young people just starting out in the industry there, as well as to retrain uh, management level and help those folks as they're retraining uh, younger employees as well. Um, I think it's fair to say that hospitality has been the hardest hit industry uh, by the workforce shortage here in Minnesota. With the new job numbers that just came out recently, we are down 32,000 jobs uh, from pre-pandemic levels. Uh, and this is an industry that in normal times employs one in 10 Minnesotans. So when you look at the total jobs deficit from pre-pandemic levels to now of private employers, that's about 33% of that deficit. So very significant. We do believe that there are projected uh, 50,000 or more employees uh, left the industry for other jobs, either lateral or what have you, over the last two years due to the conditions, uh, various uh, shutdowns, limitations, and other COVID conditions. And what that means is that when you talk to operators out there, so many of the hires that they've had in the last six months are either brand new employees or brand new to the industry. So this kind of training program that can help them ladder up quickly a certification program that can help them get the skills that they need, not just to get into the industry, but to ramp up quickly and get advanced quickly is really needed. Uh, we know that this is one of the fastest paths to management and entrepreneurship out there in the country. Uh, according to some uh, national uh, uh, data, eight in 10 uh, entrepreneurs or owners in the restaurant world start at the entry level and nine in 10 managers. We also know from federal data that Americans that get their start in this industry, which is about one in three, uh, tend to make more in their career over the course of their career, even if they move along. So uh, this is a great opportunity to, uh, to start people off on the right, right foot if they're passionate about this industry. And we certainly need the help uh, as our industry tries to, to recover here in this multi-year recovery. 
Um, so the bill as it's currently drafted with the amendment uh, sets uh, $275,000 to create a free online hospitality training program modeled after South Dakota's program. Uh, it has a $25,000 per year ongoing, and that's to fund a quarter FTE at the U of M uh, Tourism Center, uh, which would be the entity that would uh, create this, this content along with Explore Minnesota Tourism and input from industry like Hospitality Minnesota and others. We've also been hearing from other colleges like St. Paul College and Normandale and getting their feedback as well so that we create a really good program. I uh, want to thank our bipartisan authors uh, led by Senator Rood. I want to thank you, Mr. Chair, for hearing this bill here today, uh, and as well as our long list of coalition supporters that you should have in your packets, members. Uh, in the interest of time, I can stop there, but happy to take any questions. Thank you again. Uh, why don't we hold uh, Senator Uckey, quick question? No, I was just going to go on to the next testifier, so go ahead. Oh. You know what, if we've got other testifiers, let's hear them all and then we'll, okay. then I'll bring my questions up. Thank you. Uh, next we have, and I hope I pronounced this right, uh, Ms. Chen, welcome to the committee. If you could please state your name for the record and feel free to begin when you're ready. All right, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and the members of the committee. My name is Xinyi Chen. I am the director of the University of Minnesota Tourism Center. <clears throat> um, the Tourism Center is highly interested in uh, doing this work because it aligns very nicely with our mission of empowering, preparing, and supporting the tourism industry and the communities engaging in tourism for success and sustainability. We at the Tourism Center have a long history of doing educational and training programs and we also have extensive experience of uh, doing these programs in an online asynchronous format. We are the only tourism center in Minnesota, and we are also one of a small number of tourism research and education centers in the entire United States. Um, we are very well positioned in the uh, University of Minnesota Extension, which means um, we can leverage expertise and resources across Extension and also the university system. In fact, we have been doing that and serving our industry and the entire state for 35 years. Um, in the past several months, we have been working together with Hospitality Minnesota and Explore Minnesota Tourism to explore how to create and deliver an online free asynchronous customer service training program. And it is critically important that it is free of charge to business owners and also to uh, workers. We stand ready to mobilize a team of colleagues to develop uh, the curriculum, to create an online delivery mechanism and work with a wide variety of partners to roll out the program, to promote the program, especially to those most in need. We are also very excited about opportunities to partner with colleagues from the Minnesota State Colleges and University System. We very much welcome their contributions and we highly value their insights. In the past year, we at the Tourism Center have heard repeatedly <coughs> from our advisory committee members, from our partners, from businesses and communities about the dire workforce situation within our industry. As you have already heard from Ben, um, the tourism and hospitality industry was the hardest hit in our state and in the country by the pandemic. As our industry recovers, um, many new workers that the businesses managed to hire, they are either brand new to our industry or they are the young uh, first time workers. And so it is really important to business survival to make sure that these new workers are properly trained on customer service skills. Um, without these properly trained workers, Resorts across greater Minnesota, restaurants on main streets, entrepreneurs in uh, opportunity zones and the neighborhoods big and small <coughs> will all be severely stressed by workforce issues. As our industry suffers, it will have ripple effects across the broader economy. For example, if a restaurant reduces its operating hours due to shortage of workers, it wouldn't need nearly as many supplies and ingredients from the local farms which 
would, of course, have negative effect um, on these farms. So clearly, it is imperative to make sure that our state offers an online uh, customer service training program that provides the skills um, that our industry, need, industry needs out of our workers, and also that the program is convenient uh, for the workers to go through to complete that would provide them, you know, uh, some competitive edge in the in, in, in the workforce and will have no cost barrier to either businesses or the workers themselves. Thank you very much. And again, I would welcome questions. Thank you. Um, and next we have, and I hope I pronounced your name correctly, Mr. Uh, Subert. Yep, that's correct. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and feel free to begin when you're ready. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee. Uh, my name is Jason Subert, and I apologize I'm sitting to you in my living room in my recliner, but I have a broken ankle. Um, but this issue is so uh, important to me that uh, um, that I, I can't. I would love to be there in person, but I'm here today, uh, yeah, um, virtually. So um, thank you for giving us the opportunity to meet with you guys. Um, I'm an operator. I'm an innkeeper. Um, I work for TPI Hospitality. Uh, I oversee four hotels uh, in Fairmont, Minnesota, and um, in Martin County here. And um, we have um, about 223 employees that work for us just in Fairmont. TPI Hospitality is the largest owner and operator of hotels in the state. Um, we have 35 hotels and nine restaurants. Um, and so we are a key stakeholder in, in hospitality in the state of Minnesota and have been doing business um, since the early 70s here in Minnesota. So um, we're excited to, to be part of this because um, in my career as a district manager, you know, I've, I've traveled around and I've run 56 hotels in nine states, but always lived here in Minnesota. Um, and I've gotten to see firsthand in South Dakota how well this program works. Now, South Dakota's largest industry is tourism. And so obviously they're very rifled in to make sure that um, tourism is different in South Dakota than it is in other places. And I think that's one of the reasons why the program is so, so important for them, but it's also so important for us because tourism in Minnesota is different than South Dakota or Las Vegas or Florida. And this program really is custom to your state. And you know, South Dakota really talks about the importance of being an ambassador, and it really helps you educate you on where your visitors are coming from, you know, um, and that's what this has the power to do. And so even though companies like Hilton and Marriott and Culver's and McDonald's, they have these wonderful corporate training programs, but nothing in their training program has anything to do with teaching people about tourism in Minnesota. It's tourism as a global organ, you know, um, hospitality. So um, this is a two-part program. There's two benefits to this. Number one, to um, to operators like myself who are teaching people about hospitality. So onboarding people and teaching them about hospitality and tourism in Minnesota. And that's what this program has the ability to do, which none of the programs, and I, you know, we have Hilton's, Marriott's, we have all of these companies, the largest hotel companies in the world, but that product does not exist today. And that's something that everybody in Minnesota will actually benefit from Murray Steakhouse downtown to, um, you know, to grandma's up in Duluth. Everybody will benefit from this because it's hospitality specific for Minnesota. Now, the 2021 Explore Minnesota Tourism um, annual report was just printed um, about two weeks ago it was issued, you know, and they outlined there was about 16% decrease in, in employment. And folks, I want to explain really why that happens is because when, when, our, when our industry was really um, harbored and just really shut down, we didn't hire 15 and 16 year old kids to come into our employment because we struggled to have enough hours available for all of these employees that are career hospitality employees. And so for the last couple of years, now those kids are 17 and 18 years old, and a lot of them never worked, folks. And we're going to feel the effects of that for a, for a decade. And because there's new 15 and 16-year-olds coming into the marketplaces, and we hope to engage them and work with them. And our industry is perfect for them because they work nights and, and that's when kids are available and summers are peak season. So um, so we really need those. I mean, we're the second largest industry in the state with about 
you know, 250,000 employees. Um, tourism is everywhere in the state, and I would say that we're probably the most diverse workforce in the state of Minnesota. Um, and so you're going to see, you know, all different age demographics and all different races um, working in hospitality throughout the state. And our industry teaches people how to work. Um, Pete Mahala, who um, is one of the owners of Pittsburgh Blue, one time explained to me, he said, you know, we're in the manufacturing business. We do something that no other industry can do, is we can take a custom order, we can produce it, provide it, it's consumed, and we get feedback all within 45 minutes. Nike can't do that. No other manufacturer can do that. And it's those skill sets that these kids learn to prepare, do all the prep work, then go through your busy time, and the cleanup, and then it's preparing for the next day. It's the same skills that you need if you're gonna work at 3M or any other industry. And so our industry teaches people how to work, and it's a big, vast industry. And so we really hope for your support for this program, and I, I, I appreciate your guys' time, and uh, I look forward to seeing how we do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first question we had was from Senator Aki. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, some of what I was going to ask uh, was answered by these additional testifiers, which was great. But just to um, go into a little more depth with uh, about this program, um, the last testifier talked about um, basically teaching tourism of our state. And that, that is good because everybody that lives in a um, tourist-type area, which I come from, um, you walk into the local retail store or whatever, and here we're you know, more in the hospitality industry, but we kind of expect everybody standing behind the counter to uh, give us the information we're looking for. So that part is, is a good deal. But can we, the, the, it was listed or referred to as training and a certification program. Can we get a little more detail of what, um, what type of training and then what certifications might come through this? Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Ruckey. Um, so the South Dakota program has 10 different online modules, and it ranges everything from uh, how to make an experience special for a customer, how to deal with challenging situations in the workplace, to uh, knowing your region, knowing your state, and how to tell your customers about special things that they can travel to and experience in tourism. So. Each of those modules has a certification so that if you're a young person or a worker just starting out, when you complete those, you get a certification uh, that makes you marketable as an employee. So in, in, in their state, all the tourism and, and hospitality employers know what this means. It's branded by Visit South Dakota. Our vision is that here it would be branded by the U of M Tourism Center and Explore Minnesota Tourism together both really strong brands and that it would have that kind of impact. Um, that does a couple of things. Number one, if you're an employer, you know that it means something and you know that they've gone through this universal training in these soft skills that help anybody who's starting out in the service industry or hospitality or tourism. But number two, for the employee, it helps them market themselves as I've, re I've achieved these different kind of certification programs. Uh, the other thing I'll add too is we think it really dovetails well with the Pro Start culinary program and the hospitality tourism and management program uh, that are currently in the high schools and growing rapidly in Minnesota. Uh, this body last year passed a $250,000 grant to help those high schools expand those programs. But we have kind of a lack, uh, a, a shortage, I would say, of post-secondary options for folks that might be coming to this industry and could use this kind of training. And again, those certifications that we're talking about help them understand that you know, this is a career, not just a job. There are lots of opportunities to ladder up in this industry, and, and frankly, uh, probably quicker than ever now that we've got you know this workforce shortage. It's a problem for our industry. It's a tremendous opportunity for young people if they're passionate about this industry and are starting out right now. So I hope that answers your question. Yep. Thank you. Next, I have Senator Dreheim. Thank you, Chair Pratt. And if I remember right, we did a program for northern Minnesota. It was either in uh, Senator Thomasoni's or Senator Box district um, for one of the men's state institutions for some training. Um, what? Why go with a different system, the U of M, versus what we've already uh, tried to s establish in northern Minnesota with with the men's state colleges? I guess would be my question. Sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Dreheim. So there are, are um, 
a, a variety of different kind of training opportunities out there. Um, I, one of the, our last testifier was talking about what some of the brands and hotel brands might do or what a, a given corporation like grandma's might do. I think the program that you're referring to up in Cook County was an apprenticeship program. Uh, and they were really struggling and on the North Shore with getting cooks in particular and chefs and food service. Uh, and so I believe, if I recall correctly, it's a program between um, one of the community colleges up there and the high schools to try to connect some of those young people so they get on-the-job training. Not dissimilar from the dual training pipeline program that Dolly has for other industries. Uh, I think what we like about this program, uh, not, I think that's an excellent program, first of all. Uh, what we like about this program is that it's statewide. Uh, and has the a potential to be universal. And I think a program like that in Cook County could benefit from these resources to supplement what they're already doing and go beyond what you know some of the culinary training they're doing to expand it more broad to tourism. So uh, as we talked with those officials um, in, in South Dakota from Visit South Dakota, that was one of the things that they really liked is that it was universal everywhere in the state. You could go anywhere and you knew what the certification meant as a both worker and an employer. So um, I hope that answers your question. Senator, I have a follow-up. Well, I, I believe Minstead has a hospitality management degree already. Um, so I, I, I love the idea to get more people in, into the hospitality industry. Having been in it for 21 years, I, I don't disagree with that. I, I just hate to see us double up our, our resources. So that, that's it. Thank you. And thank you for bringing the bill forward. Uh, next, we have Senator Putnam. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Root, for uh, bringing this bill, and uh, uh, Mr. Wilkinson for, for testifying for us and our other testifiers as well. You know, the uh, hospitality industry is incredibly important in St. Cloud, and I was talking with a dear friend just a couple weeks ago who uh, owns a restaurant in downtown St. Cloud who was actually thinking about taking out ads in the cities to get a dishwasher uh, because of how profound was the crisis in labor. Um, and so the question I have about this particular uh, uh, initiative is how are people going to know that you're doing it? Because um, uh, it, it seems like, I'm assuming it's offered asynchronously. This is sort of you, you watch a, a video or something like that, take some, answer some questions, and then the certification occurs. But it seems to me that this also might be a way to recruit more people into this industry. To, uh, so do you have a, an agenda or a plan or an idea for how you're going to promote this opportunity uh, through all, all Minnesotans to get more people interested in going into this industry? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Putnam. Yes, absolutely. Uh, our association has a plan to communicate widely uh, to the public through ele our electronic resources, through the media, uh, you know, our understanding and our communications with Explore Minnesota Tourism as well as DEED is that they would be interested in doing promotional work along those lines too. I think, you know, as I mentioned before, uh, Explore Minnesota Tourism has a really strong brand and has a lot of communications that go out to the public. So. Um, but I think it's an all hands on deck. And, you know, as I've talked to some of these other colleges, um, I think that there's uh, room at the table for everybody within our industry to promote it, uh, as well as within academia, with, within these workforce centers and different things around the state. Um, so I, I think um, there's a variety of ways that we've already contemplated trying to get the word out on that in, in addition to what we can do as an association. Uh, and may I speak? I'm sorry, I can't see who's... May I oh, speak? Ms. Chen, About yes. Mr. All right, okay, thank you. <laughs> um, and I just would like to chime in, uh, provide a little bit more details here. Uh, one is the Tourism Center has a 22-person advisory committee, and they represent a variety of um, sectors and geographic areas within our state. And so, obviously, uh, we'll mobilize our uh, advisory committee members um, and then also our colleagues within Extension's uh, Center for Community Vitality, um, who have very deep and wide connections in their respective regions across the state. At the same time, um, we've had some uh, quiet communications uh, with Hospitality Minnesota and a few other uh, partners uh, in the industry around the state in terms of uh, how important it is to effectively roll it out and make it known and make sure that frontline workers uh, or workers at large uh, have the opportunity to actually take the program, complete the program. Um, and I think it is all hands on deck. And um, we have a lot of uh, destination management organizations, the conventions and the visitors bureaus, chambers of commerce. Um, no one should be left outside of the table. Everyone should be, bring, uh, should be brought to the table um, so that, you know, it is, 
how can I put this? It is really hopefully going as close to the level of uh, communicating with individual businesses as possible so that we will have a program that not only uh, that not only has solid content, um, but also is uh, being actively engaged with and uh, utilized. Um, so these two content and participation, these two are uh, equally important. And I really appreciate uh, the Senator's question. Thank you so much. And Mr. Subert, you wanted to discuss this? Yeah. Yeah, just real quick, um, you know, I'm a, a volunteer educator for the uh, hospitality and tourism management program um, in New Richland High School. And one of the things we work with our kids is when there's online training like this and it's specific to your state, there is a ripple effect because when this is online and you're taking a lot of this at home. And the example I will use, if you've never watched the TV show Modern Marvels and seen the story about the history of Las Vegas, why is Las Vegas there? We show this in the classroom, and it's always amazing how many times the kids share that with somebody else, because it's a fantastic story. Um, and this has that same ripple effect. So when people are doing online training at home or getting their certifications outside of the classroom, how many other people it attracts? And a lot of times, we have a lot of people who are retirees that work in our industry. And um, they retire, but they might be a breakfast host one or two days a week, a van shuttle driver or part-time bartender. They just like to do something for a couple of days a week and be around people. Um, and this is perfect for them as well. So it's not just the kids, but to really educate people. So there is this, especially the online training, it does have a ripple effect. Okay. Senator Housley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to thank uh, Senator Rood for bringing this bill. Um, as you've heard from members on the committee, that this is uh, important to all of the communities across the state and to make the training easy for the end user and um, the impact that it will have in the, the workforce. I, I love it. I didn't even know you were carrying it. We talk every day, and I didn't know about this one. So thank you, Senator Rood. I love it. Um. Just a, a, a quick question. Um, for something like this, does it qualify for any college credit um, when someone takes the course or completes the course? So, uh, Mr. Chair and members, no, this would not be an accredited program. And I think this gets back to the Senator uh, Draham's question earlier. It's not meant to replace uh, the current college programs that are out there, the two-year, four-year degree programs, which are excellent. I know Central Lakes is adding a new one as well, and you know we encourage more programs like that. This is uh, a, a accreditation program, um, and so it's meant to be faster or for folks that maybe aren't taking that pathway post-secondary yet. Maybe they'll wind up getting there eventually, but um, you know one of the ways that uh, workers get to this program in South Dakota is through the employers, and the employers use this as onboarding uh, as well as an incentive. So um, I think that's that's kind of where this is fitting a niche that's not met yet here in Minnesota. And so when someone help me understand, when, so when someone does get the certification and maybe they're moving from establishment to establishment, how does how does that work? How does the employer view that? Maybe just. Fill that in for me a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. So, uh, you know, again, in our conversations with the officials in South Dakota, what they tell us is that um, because this is an, is an established program and has the credibility of Visit South Dakota behind it, it's understood that those employees are going to be trained up better uh, than somebody that hasn't had that training. Uh, I mean, unless they've gone through a degree program or something like that uh, here in Minnesota or elsewhere. So that credibility helps them know that they've got that baseline of those soft skills that you need to work in this industry and that they're very likely going to be a better employee quicker and that they're going to ramp up quicker and be a more efficient worker. Okay. And Ms. Chen, I, I noticed that the amendment today um, uh, set forth a $25,000 a year maintenance uh, appropriation. Can you help me understand what type of maintenance we need to do on this on this program? Speak. Um, <clears throat> I would say there are a few uh, <clears throat> strategically important things each year 
uh, on an ongoing basis. One is to uh, uh, keep the content updated and uh, make sure, you know, as the industry quickly uh, evolves with uh, technology and uh, whatnot, you know, demographic trends, so on and so forth, it is obviously important for um, the content creator to make sure that the content is still up to date and uh, relevant. So that's number one. And the second piece, obviously, um, with an online program, inevitably technology is great until it's not. So we'll need to make sure that the, uh, the online platform works as it should be. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the third aspect is that you know, the program is already not only online, but also asynchronous, which means, yes, workers can take it at time convenient for them. But at the same time, when you take a program like that, it feels a one-way communication street, right? It's literally uh, us uh, talking to the folks taking the program. And I would very much love to change that even just a little bit. So if we can have somewhat of a, you know, dedicated um, partial staff time, I would put it that way, we should be able to offer you know, uh, at least uh, some questions and answers. For example, uh, if a person taking the program uh, has a question, here is an online form that you can fill out, you click submit, and within 40 or 72 hours, um, you know, you would get a response in your inbox or, you know, we, if you just provide a phone number, we can call you back, something like that. So at least they get a chance to ask uh, questions rather than a, like, thoroughly one-way communication, I would call it that way. So um, that would be my answer, and I welcome if Ben has anything to add. Okay, thank you. Mr. Seward. You know, one of the things that I, I, I saw this program work in South Dakota and the program would be updated every year, and it was very proactive. As example, um, the ladies' final four will be here in the state of Minnesota this year. Um, if there was a um, Republican or Democratic, you know, convention in Minnesota, the Super Bowl. So this twenty-five thousand dollars, what I envision is this program to be updated at the beginning of the year. And so when it comes out every year, it's also helping you understand what's going on in tourism for this coming year. So when we're educating people, there's always this element every year it has to be updated because tourism, drone footage, all this stuff keeps getting updated um, and you, you have to keep being proactive. So it's not, you know, you can't kind of set this program and forget it because everything kind of changes with tourism and, and the events and the things that are going on. Um, Okay. Yeah, Mr. Wagsland. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would just add, so the quarter FTE was specifically modeled after what they're doing in South Dakota. So we felt that that was a reasonable starting point to base it off of their experience over the last number of years. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Oh, Chair. Oh, Senator Hurst, sorry, I didn't see you there. Yeah, I appreciate the bipartisan bill um, that Senator Root brought forth, and this is an excellent subject. Uh, hospitality um, uh, to to support the hospitality uh, industry. I just wonder, like, uh, since it's open to free to all Minnesota resident, uh, how do you plan plan to outreach, let folks know, and uh, is there a limit? Let's say you know, there's a lot of people in our state. You know, is there a limit that you set so that you can be able to, you know, um, hold your capacity? would like to uh, take that on. Mr. Chair, Senator Hurt, thank you for the question. Um, at this point, I would love to have a capacity problem. <laughs> um, we think that, um, you know, again, based on South Dakota's numbers, we think that we can probably get up to, you know, roughly 4,000 uh, new workers or ongoing workers trained per year. Uh, maybe we can get beyond that if this really takes off and becomes, you know, super successful. But given that we're at a 32,000 jobs deficit right now, um, I don't I don't think that's going to be a challenge. Um, 
and I think it would be a good problem to have because even before the pandemic, we had a structural workforce shortage in hospitality in Minnesota. Um, so we need to definitely grow the pipeline uh, more and more going forward through any and all tools that we can. Uh, and in terms of um, uh, messaging on it, I we, we talked a little bit about that before, but yes, we have a strategic plan of how we would get that messaging out uh, to workers through employers, through academia, through public efforts, uh, through Explore Minnesota Tourism, through DEED, et cetera. Uh, but happy to talk with you online, offline about that further if you'd like. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Chen. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Senator. And it really is a great question that I deeply appreciate. And I would just uh, reiterate what I mentioned previously in terms of both uh, the quality of the content and uh, the rolling out marketing promotion and uh, persuading business owners to let their workers uh, take and complete the program. Uh, both sides are very, very uh, important, equally important. So um, again, I really appreciate the question. And I think um, as Ben uh, mentioned already, it will need to be uh, a uh, all hands on deck approach. It will take the entire village, the entire industry um, to to really make it known, right? And I would say, which is why I mentioned, if we can get as closely as possible to the level of uh, notifying individual businesses, at the better it is. Because then we are really um, getting the information out to those um, in need. And so, yes, the associations, organizations, a great starting place to eventually get to these individual businesses. Um, but I would say, you know, we need to be super cognizant in terms of uh, reaching deep, um, as deeply as possible. So thank you very much. So thank you very much. Okay, see no other questions or comments. Senator Rood, would you like to, any final comments on your bill? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I, I think this is really, we, with the $32,000 or 32,000 job deficit that we have, anything and everything that we can do to get our workforce back working, I, I think we should explore. The comments are made that many of our young workers have not had a job. Because of COVID, they have stayed home. They have not worked yet. And so getting, giving them the opportunity to open the door to get them back into the workforce and making it easy for them to do so, I think it really behooves us to spend this small amount of money on a program that has really proven in South Dakota to be well worth it and to be successful. So um, I would appreciate your support today. Thank you, Senator Rood. Uh, members, uh, Senate File 3771 will be laid on the will be laid over for possible inclusion. I want to thank all of our testifiers today. Senator Ruth, thank you for bringing the bill forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Committee. Thank you. Next, we have Senate File 3621. Um, it's a Senator Tomasoni bill. And we have Senator Tomasoni online, but uh, in person, we have Senator Bach on his behalf. So welcome to the committee, Senator Bach and Senator Tomasoni. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a pleasure to be here. And, and uh, Senator Tomasoni has got three constituents down here to speak to the bill. And I always say, uh, you know, if it's important enough to ask for money, it's important enough to be here. <laughs> <laughs> so I appreciate them making the making the trip down. Uh, members, this bill, uh, Senate File 3621, asks for a uh, appropriation of $250,000 uh, in 22 and in 23 to open a, another chapter of the Boys and Girls Club, which I think this committee is well aware of. Uh, there is an umbrella organization, uh, the Boys and Girls Club of the Northland, that operates out of Duluth. They've got multiple sites across uh, northern Minnesota. But the town that we don't have a chapter in is Hibbing, the largest town on the Iron Range. Uh, so the principals that are with me here today have done some very good outreach in the community uh, about the feasibility of establishing a Boys and Girls Club in Hibbing. Uh, and working in collaboration with the Hibbing uh, Public Schools on uh, on this proposal. So be, be pleased to have their testimony, Mr. Chairman. And I think we'll have to come up one at a time because all the camera is situated here so people get a chance to, uh, to see the testimony in addition to hearing it. Thank you, Senator Bach. Uh, Ms. McDonald? 
Welcome to the committee. Um, oh. Chair Pratt, committee members, my name is Kim McLaughlin. Oh, okay, sorry. That's okay. Go ahead, Ms. McLaughlin, welcome That's okay. to the committee. Uh, please state your name for the record. Okay, my name is Kim McLaughlin, and I am one of the members of the local advisory board who's been working so passionately and diligently to establish a Boys and Girls Club site in Hibbing and to serve our youth and the residents of the area. It's with great privilege and honor that I am here today in support of Senate File 3621, a bill authored by Senator Tomasoni, who has dedicated his career to making our state the best it can be, understanding that our communities are best when every person has the opportunity to become their best and to contribute through the workforce. Much preparation has gone into where we are today. We have surveyed families in our local and public and non-public schools. We went through a feasibility study conducted by the Boys and Girls Club of America, which included participation by just shy of 40 local community leaders from our area. We have a signed agreement with the Boys and Girls Club of the Northland who are excited to take on Hibbing as a site. And we have a commitment from our local school district intending to offer in-kind space and making our Boys and Girls Club site a transportation drop-off. If ratified, this bill would appropriate funds to the Boys and Girls Club of the Northland to implement summer and after-school programming at our site in Hibbing. Your support would allow for the club to open its doors this fall in the fall of 2022. The program will be sustainable because we will continue to generate grant funds and other private funds in line with the Boys and Girls Club of the Northland, which has been in existence for over 50 years. With an urgent need for this programming in our community and area, this fall 2022 opening is critical. In the words of our local school district superintendent, this is desperately needed programming in our community. In serving in my sixth year on the Hibbing School Board and nearing 25 years with the Minnesota State College and University System, I see and hear firsthand the increasingly urgent need among young people of all ages and their families. I also understand the wide array of benefits a Boys and Girls Club could provide in our area. I have no doubt that in your roles as senators and committee members, you too understand the gravity of the need that presently exists to support our current and future workforce. As you're likely aware, we are a community, an area indeed in desperate need. We are in an area that is significantly impacted by poverty, with a low median household income and a high number of families who qualify for free and reduced lunch. To aggravate this, we only have a relatively low percentage of people 25 years and older who hold college degrees. And many of our young people would continue to be first generation college students. Sadly, about 64% of Hibbing's fifth graders reported being home alone or somewhere unsupervised after school one or more days per week. Together, we have the ability to interrupt this cycle. Undoubtedly, we've all heard about the Boys and Girls Club and how they've touched the lives of so many. Boys and Girls Clubs have been around nationally for about 160 years, offering evidence-based programming that centers around three pillars of youth development, healthy lifestyles, character and leadership development, and academic excellence. To reiterate, I am proud to say that our advisory board has entered into an agreement with the Boys and Girls Club of the Northland, who recognize the multitude of benefits a Hibbing site could provide to young people and to our overall community and region. Our local school board and district have been enthusiastic partners, committing in-kind space and identifying the Boys and Girls Club site as a transportation drop-off. Through the creation of a Boys and Girls Club in Hibbing, we will support youth around these three pillars, academic excellence, character, leadership development, and healthy lifestyle styles. And we will positively impact both short and long-term range 
job and economic growth in the Central Iron Range for generations to come. Already thus far, we have had representatives from various St. Louis County agencies reach out and ask for an overview of the Boys and Girls Club of Hibbing and our initiative. Members of our advisory board met with counselors from the Northeast Minnesota Office of Job Training and others who work directly with clients seeking retraining or re-entry into the job market. With enthusiasm, they immediately requested a brochure and wanted to sign up. For their clients, having an affordable, safe place for their children to be during out-of-school hours is currently a barrier to retraining and re-entry into the job market for many. A Boys and Girls Club in Hibbing will help remove that barrier and help in getting today's adults back into the workforce most immediately. Hours available to work as well as productivity tends to fall off after 3 p.m. when children are out of school. So whether it's that miner, that nurse, the plumber, or that electrician, Productivity tends to decline when parents are worried about their children. If a parent knows that their child is in a safe, positive environment where there is after-school programming, that parent will be able to focus on the task at hand and will be able to maintain consistent employment and perhaps even working longer shifts or additional shifts. Most importantly, building that dream, that vision for our young people. A Boys and Girls Club in Hibbing will help young people in Hibbing and the surrounding area build that vision. They will be introduced to professions they may not even know existed. And that job and career exploration will begin with some of our earliest, youngest learners. Our people will connect with caring, our young people will connect with a caring adult, a mentor, who will help them form that dream and as importantly, at the Boys and Girls Club of Hibbing, we will help our young people believe in themselves and believe they can achieve. They will believe that they can be that EMT, that paramedic, that plumber, that nurse. From a very early age, they will build the foundation necessary to dream, to turn that dream into a reality. And they will be provided with the skills, the knowledge, and the passion to get there. As Minnesotans, one of the things that COVID-19 pandemic has brought to the forefront is the urgent need to improve the social, emotional need and physical health of our young people. As adults, now more than ever, we understand the importance of building character and leadership in our young people from a very early age. And in your work as senators and serving on this committee, you recognize that helping us establish a Boys and Girls Club in Hibbing can have the most positive economic and job impact today and in the years to come. Our committee, our community, and our students are passionate and working hard to establish a Boys and Girls Club site in Hibbing. For the community, for the area, youth, and for their families, it would mean the world if the tripartisan members of our Senate were to support Senate file 3621. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, committee members. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. Um, next, I have either Ms. McDonald or Ms. Tsaka. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce. Please state your name for the record, and feel free to begin when you're ready. My name is Carrie McDonald. Chair and committee members, uh, as I stated, my name is Carrie McDonald. I am also a member of the local advisory board for the Hibbing Girls and Boys Club Initiative. I've been an educator in Hibbing for 25 years, serving as a high school math teacher, assistant principal at the high school, and now I am an elementary principal. The demographics of our community have changed over the past 25 years. We currently have over 50% free and reduced lunch population in our elementaries. Our students and families are in desperate need of a, the Boys and Girls Club in Hibbing. As Ms. McLaughlin stated, there are the three pillars of academic excellence, me, character and leadership development, and healthy lifestyles. I'd like to focus on character and leadership development um, and the workforce readiness program that the Boys and Girls Club can offer. 
I think that's why we're here today. <laughs> Communica communities across the nation face significant challenges ensuring young people are adequately prepared to enter the workforce. Boys and Girls Clubs are closing the opportunity and job readiness gap by preparing youth for success in their first job and helping them develop a plan to pursue the career of their dreams. The four key areas of workforce development that are included in the Boys and Girls Club programming are essential skill development, which would be age appropriate social emotional development, employability skills and certificates, such as interviewing, resumes, technical skills, career exposure, discovery opportunities, and career assessments, and then work-based learning, real-life hands-on experiences in the world. All of the programs in the Boys and Girls Club provide amazing opportunities for our students, but ultimately having a safe and positive environment while building supportive relationships with caring adults will meet our children's basic needs. And those are things that I see every day in my job. I ask that you support Senate File 3621 for our kids. Thank you, Chair and Committee members. Thank you. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and feel free to begin when you're ready. Hello, my name is Ruva Tsoka. Um, good afternoon, Chair and Committee. Um, I am also a member of the advisory board of the Boys and Girls Club of Hibbing and I've been serving in the community relating to youth development and... Um, Excuse me, could you just get a little closer little to the microphone? You're no very soft-spoken. I, yeah, I get that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I have been serving in the community for about two years relating to youth development and uh, uh, care. So throughout my two years living in Hibbing, I have come to see the strength of the community and the love and support that they have for each other. Additionally, meeting with community members, I have recognized the hope for having youth development programming especially for those who do not um, have the means of participating in extracurricular activities. Parents also struggle finding wraparound services for their children, especially that has been highlighted during the pandemic. Hibbing has a unique workforce where many families have shift schedules and often need uh, care outside of the typical nine to five job. Um, and as mentioned earlier, demographics of Hibbing makes it all the more difficult to find affordable options for a care that uh, parents can use. So the combination of the challenges, availability, uh, wraparound needs, and affordability are challenges that the Boys and Girls Club of Hibbing can offer and uh, supplement. The programming that will be offered is proven, meaning that it's evidence-based and guaranteed to pro provide positive results. Um, the Boys and Girls Club is also a way to invest in the community, so every dollar that is given to the club will yield about $10 in economic benefits. Um, there are many perks that of establishing a club in, in Hibbing can offer um, that I would be willing to speak on for further questions. As a former uh, club member of a uh, Boys and Girls Club in Omaha, I can safely say that it is a beneficial program that allowed me to experience a lot of things I otherwise wouldn't have if I either stayed at home. It also gave my mom a sense of peace of mind, knowing that the people who were caring for me were there for me. Um, uh, there's also a very strong alumni uh, presence in the Boys and Girls Club of Hibbing, as you can very well see, um, and um, the service of giving back to the clubs. Uh, other programming that fills, um, they offer programming that fills gaps and opportunities for kids to learn something new, and I believe that it is a perfect fit for Hibbing, especially at this time in, in day. Uh, Chair and committee members, uh, we stand for questions, and thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Senator Aki. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, uh, to either Senator Bach or the testifiers, it's got appropriations for this year and next year. And did I, just to kind of clarify that, that's kind of the setup and everything. And after that, do you, it, it's expected that the grants and such coming in will fund it and keep it going, right? Yes. Well, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, it's kind of who's the first dollar in. And the federal government has a program called the 23rd Century Community Learning Grant Program, but you can't qualify for that until you have, you have an existing program operating. So in the third year, they'd be eligible for federal grants. And I'm sure there's plenty of foundation money available. It just is sometimes with these things, it's a question of kind of 
who's the first one in in order to leverage other dollars. But. Yeah. yeah, and Chair, Senator, and we are and have gotten some community support already, but we are trying to get this up and running. And so, yes, the notion would be that we will follow suit with the Boys and Girls Club of the Northland, which includes federal grant money, which includes private grant money. Um, but we really would like to get this going so we can be operating. And in order to do that in our agreement with the Boys and Girls Club of the Northland, um, well, one of the reasons you have to find an existing chapter is to um, in help ensure sustainability. And so Northland is requiring, in order for us to open our doors, that we have our first year budget in the bank and the second year committed. And so, yes, I mean, we are getting donations as we speak. I mean, but to get what we need to open in the fall is why we're here today. Super, thank you. This yeah. it's a great project, and just was kind of wondering what yeah. all the steps, and you got a lot of pieces to put together. But we do, and I and I you're cannot doing well. thank the Boys and Girls Club of America, the Boys and Girls Club of the Northland. Um, Boys and Girls Club of the Northland also has sites in Greenway and Grand Rapids, who are now in their fifth year, so they've relatively recently gone through this process, and it's very sustainable and it's very viable, and they are welcoming us into the family of the Boys and Girls Club. So, thank you. Any other questions? Sorry. Um, um, not David. Oh, oh. That sounded like T Senator Tomasoni. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I hope you will be able to fund this important bill. Thank you, Senator Bach. Thank you to my testifiers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members for hearing this bill. Thank you, Senator Tomasoni. Chair, Senator Tomasoni, thank you so much. It means the world to us. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I, I should say what you just heard. Uh, uh, Laura and I stopped to see David last Thursday on our way home, and uh, he's talking with his eyes, if you can imagine. There's technology where he looks at a, a screen and picks out letters and it strings them together, and then he can save phrases and things. It's pretty pretty remarkable. There, they, I remember last fall he, he told me that they were recording his voice so that when he <clears throat> starts using this new technology, it would be his voice coming across. But apparently they're having some trouble with the technology. <laughs> They've got all of his sentences and mannerisms all uh, stored, but they're having some trouble, some algorithm, carpenters don't know anything about that, uh, to, <laughs> connect the, to, to connect it up to the soft, to the hardware, I guess. But someday we're going to hear him in his own voice when he's talking with his eyes like that. Well, we're looking forward to it. Senator Putnam, you had a question? Uh, th thanks, Mr. Chair. This is a, 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 a quick one, I think, for our testifiers. I think I read somewhere that the building was donated. That the, seems incredibly cool. The space was donated. The space was donated? Yep, Chair, Senator, the space was donated um, in one of our um, schools. Yep. That's great. Thank you. That's all I wanted to check in. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Well, members... Oh, before we begin, before I give you the, the final word, Senator Bach, I just wanted to say that, you know, one of the things that we do in this committee is, is try to remove barriers to employment. And we've had a great relationship with the Boys and Girls Club over the, the several years that I've been uh, a part of this committee, uh, helping parents find uh, not just a place for their kids to be, but a place for their kids to thrive while they're at work. And so... Uh, that's one of the reasons why this is front of, in front of this committee is, is because um, we do want to help parents get back to work and, and providing for their families. So, Senator, Senator Bach, any final comments? Mr. Chairman, it was, it was expressed on the floor on Thursday, a, a common line that Senator Tomasoni would use when he'd present a bill. He'd say, it's a good <laughs> bill, vote for it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, Senator Tomasoni, thank you for joining us today and for your comments. Uh, Senator Bach, thank you for presenting the bill here in person today and, and to all your testifiers for coming down. We appreciate it. Uh, with that, uh, Senate File 3621 will be laid over for possible inclusion. Thank, thank, you. thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Our final bill of the day, members, is Senate File uh, 2860, Senator Housley. Senator Housley, whenever you're ready. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, before you is Senate File 2860, a bill to fund the East Side Neighborhood. Since 1915, East Side Neighborhood Services has provided essential services, made connections, and stabilized community for close to one million people. Always evolving, East Side embraces the challenges of adopting to the needs and strengths of communities by meeting people where they're at. And, and in a respect for time here, I know we're short on it, I'll just be quick. Currently, the four pillars of their work include education for all, employment, vital living for older adults, and mental health. And this uh, bill and this funding will support two programs, the Senior Community Service Employment Program and the CNA Plus Program. And both programs are focused on filling the uh, Minnesota work gap. Thank you. And I have with me, I'm going to have Christine Martin, um, the president of Eastside, go first. And then I'm going to have uh, Mr. Juan Preston, a recent SCCEP graduate and current employee. So, And then we'll go to the online um, with Tenzing. OK. Well, welcome to the committee, Ms. Martin. Please state your name for the record and feel free to begin when you're ready. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Pratt and members of the committee. I'm Christine Martin, and I'm the president of Eastside Neighborhood Services, which resides in northeast Minneapolis. I appreciate the opportunity to present to you today in person, which was uh, uh, an unexpected uh, positive, uh, about Senate File 2860. To the names Kramarczyk's Deli or Polish National Alliance Hall, Emily's Le Lebanese Deli, the Minnesota Lakers, Afghan Football Pizza, or Walt Diesick sound familiar to any of you? If they do, I'd like you to know that they were all touched by, served by, or connected to Eastside Neighborhood Services in some way since 1915 or over the last 100 years. Eastside has brought people uh, to community for the last 100 years uh, to learn English, to teach how to start a business, uh, to help people find jobs, People became citizens, and children played every sport known to the Twin Cities uh, at the space of the building. As a settlement house, our responsibility was settling or resettling people uh, into community and supporting hundreds of thousands of people while they sought to become contributing members, both economically and socially, uh, to a community. Today, we still do this. But as Senator Housley said, we focus on four areas, education, employment, mental health, and vital living for older adults. Our goals are to meet people where they are at, to be responsive in a culturally uh, respectful way with our programming, and most of all, to always be looking for gaps in the way that we do our work or the way uh, the external environment is changing where programs uh, don't seem to meet the expectations uh, that they said that they would. So uh, we're not very big, but we are very agile, uh, and we are very responsive. The gaps we want to talk about today are first, training approaches in the medical pathways, and second, uh, the economic paradigm that seems to overlook a vital population necessary to our workforce, and that is older adults. Today we are asking for $500,000 to expand our model for preparing people in the entry level uh, medical workforce. We want people to be excited about the, this, this uh, type of work. We want people to understand how important this type of work is. Uh, we want the, uh, them to understand what is health care and understand the importance of their role. But we also want them to understand that if you enter the world or the work world as a CNA, a certified nursing assistant, there are so many other options available to you if you stick with it and if you really understand the concept of the healthcare industry that you're entering into. 
This is hard to build. And so when we see uh, a gap in this workforce, not only are there few numbers or less numbers than what we need, there's also a significantly high turnover in this field. And so what we'd like to do with the funds that uh, we are asking for is one, to bring the training inside of our organization as opposed to using the community colleges that we, uh, that we currently use, their training and certification process. We have to wait in a queue for a long time. We have a group that's getting ready to start that got uh, where we got into the queue last October. So that shows how long and how backed up some of the community colleges are. So we'd like to bring the certified training in-house we also uh, intend to continue with adapting the learning environment to the assets that the cohort bring themselves. Uh, what are the learning styles? How are they learning in the space? But to be responsive to that, we'd like to be able to hire two or three case managers to work with the individuals, not just the training, but what happens when they get into the job? What happens when they have their first disruption or run into their first barrier? To keep, give them all the chances to stay in that job. We also want to provide daycare. We have a daycare in our, in our organization. We want to provide daycare um, during the time that people are in training. Uh, we want to extend our partnerships with the healthcare industries. Uh, currently, we are connected to Fairview and um, North Memorial, but we want to build greater inroads into some of the larger healthcare systems who have community clinics and other um, uh, and a variety of healthcare systems. We intend to expand our focus areas beyond just the entry level CNA, but to also build, uh, and this is by request of participants to move into phlebotomy, uh, end of life care, trauma informed healing, mental health crisis, um, how to think on the job when something is presented to you that you haven't been presented to before. So uh, a variety of ways in which we want to expand. We do base the learning in cohort and shared learning. So uh, the participants really begin to build a network of people who are in this field along with them. We currently can only serve 30 people a year because of the waiting list. Um, uh, we'd like to, and we think we can move this number up to about 100 if we are able to bring uh, the training and certification in uh, in-house and have the case managers. Um, and of course, at a lower cost than the money that we uh, are charged at the community college. The second program, I know I'm talking fast, but the second program uh, is the Senior Community Services Employment Program. What is this? Most people haven't heard of this. It's a federally funded workforce training. It's federally funded for, uh, through the Department of Labor for subsidized employment for older adults who are all low income, means tested, 55 and older. Our role at Eastside is the administrative role, minimal case management, and we work with over 54 organizations that hire the individuals into their organization uh, for the four years that they can be on subsidized programming. Uh, they are limited to 20 hours a week um, by the, by the um, design of the program. We place over 220 people a year. We're the largest provider in this state. And uh, we have the second highest rating of completions and placement across the country through this program. Although this program is great, and I could run through hundreds of testimonies of people I have spoken to, and you're going to hear today from one. Retention is not uh, um, adequate as far as we are concerned. About 38% of the people that get placed remain in that job, and that is not acceptable to us. Even though it's second highest in the nation, we don't feel like it's enough. Older adults want to work. They can work. They're very smart. They're very connected. But sometimes they need some help after they're placed in the job around facing the challenges and the barriers of earning money, not unsubsidized, and dealing with housing, dealing with transportation, other things that come up. We are asking also $500,000 for this program to expand our, administrative, our administration from one person to four. Additional staff uh, who will work with clients after programs. We will focus on, as I call, um, busting the barriers, but dealing with things like 
falling off of subsidized housing, medical assistance or medical care, taking care of your grandchildren, um, and wanting to work. Um, we want to do some, uh, some expanded work with the United Way um, and with other um, agencies or collaborators that are looking at the benefits cliff, what happens when somebody makes too much money and they fall off other programs, how do we as a society and as a system of government support that? We'd like to serve more immigrant communities. We'd like to change the, um, the agencies that hire our people from nonprofits and government to include corporations. Um, we serve 220 people, as I have said. However, we do believe we could serve more if we had the support of the state. I am going to cease my testimony at this point, and I want to thank Senator Housley for sponsoring this bill and supporting us to be here today. More important than me are the two participants who are here today. The first one uh, will be Juan Preston, who is to my right, and the second one will be Tenzin Kando. Juan is a graduate of the CSEP program, works for Eastside Neighborhood Services Transportation, and Tenzin, who will be on in a minute, uh, is a graduate of our CNA program, and I understand is sitting in the parking lot taking this call because she has a shift coming up at the hospital. So I will uh, cease and hand it over to Juan. Thank you, Ms. Martin. Welcome to the committee. Uh Mr. Preston, please state your name for the record and feel free to begin when you're ready. Sir oh, Housley, good can you afternoon, tip the, Mr. Chair and the, uh, members. There you go. My name is Juan Preston. Um, I'm a graduate of the CSEP program for seniors. Um, I'm a past U.S. Army Vietnam veteran, came here to Minnesota in 98. Um, I have been uh, trained in mechanical maintenance, uh, which I've done for a number of years uh, with Westinghouse and um, then with various trucking companies. I drove for over 20 years over the road. Uh, uh, with coming here to Minnesota, I worked for O'Reilly Auto Parts as uh, their uh, mechanical maintenance specialist. Uh, there was a significant work injury back in um, September of um, 98, and it, well, I'm sorry, 2008. It took me out of the workplace for quite a while. Um, after recovery, I wanted to return to work but couldn't find any place that um, would uh, help a senior go back to work. They seemed to think I was too old or didn't want to work. So um, I was right down the street from East Side and never knew it was there till after I moved out of the, the East Side area to um, Bloomington. Uh, I finally found out about East Side through word of mouth, joined the program, but I jumped into something so quickly wanting to work that I really couldn't handle it at the time. So I dropped out of the program back in 2016, but eventually returned. When I did return to Eastside, I found that the program was a lot different than um, what I had experienced in the beginning. It was more based on helping um, an individual find work, but keep work in a lot of different ways. Um, uh, I really didn't have any uh, background in uh, technology and computers. Um, Eastside has a computer lab. Uh, they stressed that. I didn't know how to fax um, resumes or anything like that. I learned all of that. Uh, advanced computer training. Um, so I stayed with the program, the pandemic hit, and uh, that put a lot of us out of uh, work for a while. Um, and um, they brought me back in because I was working in the transportation department still, and it was sort of a vital position to have. So uh, I was still with the, the program, but um, not 
like I want it to be. So as um, time went on, I became more valuable, which is something I really wanted. I was placed into a uh, permanent position. Uh, I graduated from the program. Um, one thing about graduating from the program, it's a very good feeling, but it brings on a lot of other different stresses like um, housing, um, medical, because as my income changed, everything else changed. Um, the, my medical and uh, prescriptions, all of that was dropped. I had to start trying to afford all of that again. Um, I'm, I'm on Social Security. I'm retired. So Eastside really helps with uh, a lot of different things. I'm no longer in public housing. I'm still on subsidized housing, but I'm a senior, so uh, I enjoy that part of it. But um, without um, the senior program, I think uh, I wouldn't be in the position I am today. Um, there are a lot of seniors out here that want to return to work, and Eastside is a good place for them to, uh, to go to. They just have to have knowledge of it. So, um, That's good. thank you for for listening to me. Um, I would have talked forever, but <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And then online, Mr. Chair, is um, Tenzin Kando. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Senators. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank uh, all the members of the committee for allowing me to share my experience. My name is Tenzin Kando. My parents were from Tibet. I was born and brought up in India. I moved here when I got married to my husband. And when I got here, I really needed a job, a job that would be fulfilling and they would uh, uh, pay my livable wage. I had medical training from my hometown, New Delhi, but then uh, that medical training did not uh, directly transfer to American medical system. I wanted to uh, continue my career in the medical field, uh, but I, didn't, I really didn't know where to start. So I'm so grateful. I found nursing assistant program uh, at Eastside Neighborhood Services. I was able to make it through the course and got registered as nursing assistant. And uh, Eastside Neighborhood staff played a really uh, big role in it. Uh, they not just helped me to get through my skills training, but they also made me proud of the uh, skills and uh, of, uh, like made me proud of my experience that I already had. And um, even though I was from a different country and I had accent, uh, I felt welcomed and I always felt connected to all my classmates and we would have games and uh, fun times where we would feel like, we, I felt like I was opening up, so it was really uh, nice to have all those. And then we also had life skills training that still is helpful to me. And even after uh, completing my nursing assistant program, uh, they helped me uh, get my job. It was during the early months of COVID, so uh, I was uh, having difficult to get jobs. So they helped me uh, get, uh, prepare my applications and they call nursing homes and uh, find out how to, uh, the best way possible to submit my applications. And uh, being, in a, being a CNA has helped me grow as a person and my skill as well. And today I'm working as a nursing assistant in Broadway Senior Living and I'm really happy. And me and my husband, we're expecting our first child in a few months. Um, and I'm also working on my nursing credential. Uh, I, I'm, I will always be grateful to Eastside Neighborhood Services for whatever support and uh, whatever they have provided me and all my classmates. Uh, I welcome the possibility I could continue training through them to help my family and my career grow. <laughs> Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thank and, you. Uh, you know, Ms. Ms. Kondo and Mr. Preston, thank you for your stories. They were, they were, uh, uh, very, they're very powerful stories. So, do we have any questions for Ms. Martin, Senator Housley, or our testifiers? Ms. Martin, I have I have one that, that kind of came up in your testimony. You mentioned 
moving your your uh, nursing program out of uh, out of the community college and bring it in house. Um, do you have a program that's accredited? How are you how are you managing that aspect of it? Uh, thank you, Chairman Pratt, uh, members. We do not have the program in house at this point in time. We've been negotiating with a couple of uh, women who are, are uh, certified and, and, and registered both trainers and medical professionals about possibly taking this role if we were to receive the, the funding to, to come inside. Um, we also uh, intend to purchase the equipment that uh, the college provides in the training lab to purchase that equipment. We've got the space for uh, all of that extra um, equipment uh, and the learning space as well. So it's really uh, to use some of this money as the startup for that, uh, for that um, medical lab, I guess I would say, uh, as well as to secure a, certifi a certified teacher to come in and be able to do that. We have a couple of other certifi certifi uh, certificate and training programs at Eastside now in other areas, and so we know that process mm -hmm. of getting uh, all the legal work done and certification process done. So it would be, it's an aspiration to be able to do this. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, we'll see. No, I want to thank you. You had a uh, you had us out at the at uh, earlier in the year, and it was uh, it was a a really interesting uh, opportunity to see your program and your facility. So thank you, uh, Senator Housley. Any closing comments? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair and members, for hearing the bill. It is it is a, a great organization, and, and from the testifiers, you can tell that the money goes a long way. So thank you. Thank you. Well, with that, uh, Senate File 2860 will be laid over for possible inclusion. Uh, members, um, that's, that concludes our business for today. We'll be meeting on Wednesday, but we'll be in, uh, in the Senate building, room 1200. Uh, we'll be hearing two bills, a Senator Matthews bill and then a Senator Franzen bill on robotics, and we're going to have some of our uh, high school robotics teams in to show uh, some of the work that they've been doing. So I thought it'd be kind of fun to, to do something a little bit different. Uh, members, if you can hang out for just a couple of minutes after we're done, uh, those in the room, if you can hang out for a couple of minutes after we're done, uh, we'll stand adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>